Magic. Hi, this is TV. This is Shimon Ryan Records. This is Bailey. This is Marcus Intellects watching Drum Bass Arena TV style. This is Adam Mitch. This is Ed Rush and Optical. This is Red Wine Ram Records. Baseline Smith. Drum Sound. This is DJ Flight. This is Friction. This is Shy Fix. This is Fierce. This is DJ Craze. Keep that market on Drum and Bass Arena. Dibbly live inside the ride. Matthew Swift on Drum and Bass Arena. This is MC Shabba right now. DJ SS Sunday night. MC Fat Man D. This is Addiction at the Drum and Bass Arena. Yo, this is Juju Futuro recording San Francisco. I'm DJ Empress from New York City, New York. Daddy Freddy Panya Kana. Hey, this is Tali from Full Cycle. This is Photek on Drum and Bass Arena. This is High Contrast on the Drum and Bass Arena. What you see is Drum and Bass TV. Have a good day. This is Andy C from Ram Records and you're watching Drum and Bass Arena. I started playing the drums when I was about five. Just sort of like eating things and playing around and stuff and always been into rhythms and stuff. But musically, didn't really, didn't really get into music until kind of like I was about 11 or 12. And literally the first tune that ever really got under my skin was Voodoo Ray, which I've said loads of times when my sister played it to me. I was making tunes before I was a DJ. I um, was actually making tunes for about a good two years before I'd even had a go on a pair of decks. Um, but literally, like, I met uh, Red One a good 12 years ago now, probably longer than that, at work experience. He was like, oh, I'm putting on parties. I've got a rave going on in Bishopsgate. It's called Imagination. I'm like, yeah, you're doing like... He's like, yeah, it's my first party. Why don't you come down? So like, I, went, I went down to it and I was like, oh, I'll make tunes. And so I went down to his party and I just, I remember standing there and just seeing the guys, all the guys from Syndicate FM uh, back in the day, like um, DAZ, Daz, M-A-T-T, Just Jones, MB, 
all guys that are now making drum and bass, but back then it was like my first experience of um, watching a DJ. Everything that was going on that night was really, really special. And I rung Web One up on Monday. I was like, man, I've got to get a pair of decks, bro. Do you know what I mean? I've got about 150 quid saved up. It's all what I've got. What, what can I do with that, you know? And he's like, you need to get, well, I don't know, I guess we'll we go down to the shop, the local disco shop, you know, and I bought a pair of Sound Lab DLP ones, belt drives, and um, a proper old school HW International mixer, I remember, and getting it home, and like literally, I was just hooked, mate. I used to live in my, in my bedroom day and night, practicing on them decks, man. It was just like, once I got, once I switched them on, it was like literally the whole day could go by, and I wouldn't even know, man. The first rave was like 91. I've been making tunes since like 1990. Um, started around records in 92. Um, and me and Ant have been working together for years. The Valley of Shadows is actually the third release. No, the fourth release on Ram, Ram 4. So, you know, it was like, I guess it, that was a two year period of like doing, I used to do like uh, Pirate Radio, Syndicate FM. Um, used to do loads of local parties in the area. Slammers, yeah. So it was like a you know a gradual build up and all that until and keep continually making the tunes and it releasing loads of different tunes on other labels. But it wasn't until you know started Ram Sour Mash EP was the first release. It took me six months to make and I just literally wanted to put it out as a white label. And the, the whole way it came about was um, okay. So how did you get a white label pressed? All right. So loads of research, ringing PR records in. Wimbledon was where we pressed it, ringing up the, you know, finding out about how to do that. And it's like, okay, you can get record labels with printing on, put on the records, how hard's that, you know? So it's like, literally, when we found out that that was it, it's like, oh, we can st start a record label then. You know what I mean? And what should we call it? And my sister's like, Ram sounds good, you're an Aries, you know? It's like, it all, it all fits in. And she drew, hand drew the first logo for me. And that's what went on the record. I guess the turning point was definitely Valley of the Shadows. Um, if you can, you know, call it a turning point when people were suddenly like, okay, who's, the, who's these guys, do you know what I mean? That started, was a B-side, you know, and we only pressed a couple of thousand for the first run, and it literally just came out and just went absolutely crazy. And I remember going out to all the, all the clubs. I weren't even old enough to get in the clubs, do you know what I mean? But I was getting a couple, um, going out and meeting people, and they was like, yeah. Valley of the Shadows, you never made that. I was like, yeah, seriously. And it like, it's sort of right, they was like, okay, well maybe, you know, give the guy a chance. Um, Red One had sent out some tapes that I'd done, like mixtapes, um, to uh, Elevation, um, who was doing a club at the time down, Club Dada on Shaftesbury Avenue, and also to all the other promoters at the time, all the big promoters, but Elevation were the ones that got back. And they was a massive rave promoter at the time, so for them to ring back and say like, yeah, okay, that's a good tape, we're gonna give you a booking. And uh, they give me like one till two in the morning or something like that on with MCMC, I remember. Um, it was like my first gig in Shaftesbury Avenue and it was just, you know what I mean? Crazy experience, crazy experience. Red One's car broke down on the way down there, so we had to end up getting a night bus down there and a night bus over all the records, but it was just one of them things, man. It was just completely mind blowing. We met Sting from Telepathy, who was starting a club in, uh, at the Wax Club, starting a night, and it was originally going to be Garage, and, um, or House at the time, and like, he said, oh, I'm going to try this, there's this new thing, jungle or something like that. I'm going to try, you know, I'm going to put on like a jungle night, like telepathy. I'm going to call it, because he, he'd put on like legendary rave called telepathy, like Marshgate Lane, all the old classic raves. And um, he was like, I'm going to call it Club Telepathy. Why don't you come down? You can play a few records. And I was like, yeah, cool. Went down in the first week and I was down there every week for the next two years. <laughs> Like, you're going out, you're in a club, or you're in a party, or a big rave, or wherever it is you're chosen. You're out to have fun, you know, have a good time, man. It, it's not something that, um, it's kind of like, oh, I need to be a DJ, so I'm gonna learn how to mix. It's like, it was a complete passion, do you know what I mean? I spent hours and hours and hours on the decks for years. It's all 
just being lucky, lucky enough to jump and do what I do, you know what I mean? And like that people have been into what, what I'm doing. Another big highlight as well is like the Ram vibe with all the crew, you know what I mean? Like Ant Miles, you know, being there from day one, Shimon, Moving Fusion, Red One, having all the crew there, you know what I mean? And the crew that we've all grown up together. Um, and we've all kind of learnt the ropes together and, and you know, and been going through it, you know, that's special as well, man. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, like, we must be one of the only musics in, you know, in the world that the DJs just play an hour. Or in the UK, or 45 minutes to an hour, there's so much more to express than an hour's worth of music. Um, and there's so much more music out there that's worth Playing. And you know what it's like if you've got a load of DJs on in the same, you know, in the night, say eight DJs over the eight hours, you're going to hear that certain tunes are going to get played more than once, or, or well more than once, you know what I mean? Well, and it's been a friend of the family for ages, and he came round. Like, I had a little, I had a Atari ST and a little sampler, and he, and he came round, and like, he was just like, and he doing music as well in the studio and he was like wow that sounds different why don't you come around you know pop around we'll have we'll just have a laugh and all that and see what happens and that was in like 91 it's 2003 and we're still like you know still going strong man you know because Ant's an amazing producer don't, um, he's been doing stuff for years do you know what I mean Shimon's like I say we've been me and Shimon have been going out to parties raving together since we was 15 16 um, so that's you know that's where that link is you know and it, and I think in like '96, Shim's like I really fancy having to go out making some change you know I really want to get a setup what well, you know and he's always taking his laptop when he's touring abroad coming back with new plugins and new tunes on the go man do you know what I mean? We are always like getting loads and loads of demos through the post at Ram every week, you know, and like every fortnight, three weeks, we kind of listen, you know, have a big listening uh, time, sit down and hear it, or take it out in the car when I'm on the road or something like that. Um, and that's kind of specifically why, you know, we started them other labels, um, Frequency and Highlight, is specifically to. Um, bring in new people and you know there's so many like I was saying there's so many people making tunes and DJing and doing all this just need a break you know so it is literally a case of like every every tune that's been on frequency or, or on highlight has come from a demo on the, through the post we've signed tunes from Finland from France from the north of England the south of England from America and all that, and it's, you know, it's great because, like I say, there's so many tunes. All right, may, maybe not for Ram, but like this, you know, give people, you know, a break. So there's definitely, you know, it's definitely an opportunity to get like new new blood through. You know what I mean? And introduce new people to the scene. There was a certain amount of media interest in '95, and that died off, and everyone was proclaiming drum and bass is dead, whatnot, but that's just the media aspect of it. Drum and bass has never been a scene that's needed uh, any media hype. So essentially there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people around the world that love drum and bass. You know, they, they don't need any magazine to tell them drum and bass is cool, you know, drum and bass is this, drum and bass is that, you should, you should be into this, they're just art, you know what I mean? It's The internet has expanded drum and bass massively. Do you know what I mean? It's reached it into corners of the world where there's, you know, there'd never been a club or, a, or you know, that played drum and bass or a music shop that sold drum and bass and all that. And I think like it's fantastic. You know what I mean? It's a whole, you know, online community of people that over the past few years have hooked up and linked up and, you know, even t taking drum and bass a step further. I think it's a great outlet for new people. Um, to come in and like say, yo, check my tune, you know what I mean? Check my tune out, download it here, you know, check this out. It brings through new, fresh ideas, and I think it's great. Well, I just think 
D&B set to expand and grow even bigger, you know what I mean? I think with like every new generation of people that come into it, they're, they're getting excited by the same things that you know we all got excited by. It's just such a worldwide thing now. Everywhere you go, all around the world, there's scenes, there's you know, crews, there's DJs, producers, promoters, club nights, you know, it's going off all around the world. What an MC's job is to do within drum and bass is just a compliment. The MC compliments the DJ and versa vice, um, reads the crowd. An MC is somebody that relates what the DJ likes from what he likes from what the crowd likes. An MC supposed to be a master of ceremony or whatever. To me, it's music connection. That's my new word for an MC. To be a good MC, a good drum and bass MC, I think you need a fairly powerful voice. I think you need to be fairly clear. And you've got to have a lot of balls, straight up. Because you can't just go MC in the bedroom for the rest of your life. He's confident with his lyrics and he's confident with the crowd. No personality, charisma, stage presence, you, it all's all the package. It's not just one thing you've got to be good at. Nowadays, lyrics just ain't enough. It's all about being versatile, having your own style. It's not about biting, man, watching the next man. Just do your own thing. Basically, what makes a good MC is, what, is when you're right. And when you, when you speak it, people can see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, picture it when you're talking. You know, some people, you can't picture nothing with that. Yeah, I know you listen to music, but I know you play PlayStation as well. I know you like your cars as well. Or I know, you, you know, anything that I know that I think that you may relate to, I'm going to try and spit about. If they're a lyricist, then obviously this stuff has to be, it has to be written or it has to be constructive. I don't, not into the, as Navi would say, do, re, mi, one, two, three, MC, you know what I mean? In the beginning, it's all battle lyrics, me, 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 slaying other MCs, I'm the, I'm the top dog, I'm the man, you know? But now there's more love in the game. <laughs> Me personally, I chat a lot of girl lyrics because yeah. man like me love me girl them still. <laughs> yeah, so I've got enough girls lyrics. I've got certain bad man lyrics, certain shot in lyrics. You know, you've got party lyrics, rave lyrics, vibes lyrics. You know, you can, you can open up the whole spectrum. What I'm talking is the real. You know what I mean? Big man boss four and nine, police them search and sometimes they want to find. It's just, it's just lyrics at the end of the day and the lyrics is from real life scenario. Not saying that, you know what I mean, we're in it, but I'm just saying, that's life. A lot, a lot with me is just that I've been through a lot and I've seen a lot and I chat about what I've seen. And as a white guy as well, I grew up on the street, so I was, you know, I grew up in Hackney, East London, around a lot of things happening. So I chat about what I can see and what I've seen in my life. If a DJ's playing wicked rhythm tracks, yeah, he just draws words out of my mouth. He will make me say some other things. There's a load of words floating above my head. Yeah, you just grab the words. When you're in a freestyle, you just grab the words. You've got words floating, whole loads of words in, in, in this world, you know? It's not really about firing lyrics all the time. It's about, being able, it's about just being able to hold the crowd. I mean, you could be firing lyrics all night long, and if people ain't moving, then that ain't a good MC. Boy, a lot of people say it's about the double time and that, but really and truly, it's about your style. I think the double time thing has just been totally ripped, basically. I think everyone's doing it because they think that that's the that that's the way it should be done, but not necessarily in certain instances. Yeah, but not necessarily over every tune. A lot of the time in the rave, people don't necessarily hear what you're saying. All they can hear is the double time flow. And when you get time to break it down a bit, people can understand lyrics a bit more and stuff like that. The clarity, clarity, as I said, is always very important. Any good MC that's worth their salt will feel the music and want to shut up when certain mixes is one. In anyway, kind of start getting confused. But I'm a man. They like to just hear their own voice. I think. But my definition of a good MC is knowing when to shut up. A good MC will know when to keep quiet and know when to do his thing. Yeah. The wrong MC won't, and that's when you have problems. Right. Or, when, or when you get like seven 15 year olds in some back of back rave, <laughs> all, all battling with each other and forgetting that there's even a DJ there. You get me? Them times now, you just have to. Out comes the mic, straight up. Straight up. Roll back. Yeah. <laughs> to become a, a good MC, you have to be just be on it. Yeah, in it, with it, got through the ups and down, lyrically. And stay focused, stay away from drugs. Yeah.
I smoke cannabis. <laughs> in, your, in my philosophy, or in the real philosophy then, because it's not even my philosophy, it's, this is a universal philosophy, right? You have the past, you have the present, and you have the future, yeah? And they're all linked, yeah, by energy, yeah? You have the energy to take things from the past into the future, and then from the present into the future. So you have to understand how to conduct your own energy. You have to understand how to use your skill to attain or achieve what it is your aspiration is. That is not an MC thing or a DJ thing or, you know what I'm saying? You guys out there watching this are thinking, you know, might, might be thinking, oh, shut up, or you might be thinking, wow, yeah? But the same guy that's holding the camera, right, was never, wasn't born holding the camera, yeah? Just like I wasn't born holding the mic, yeah? And the guy that's asking the questions, he, he couldn't speak when he was born, yeah? As a matter of fact, right, I couldn't sit on the toilet and go and have a number two by myself, yeah? My mum used to clean my batty for me, yeah? So I'm saying everybody comes from nothing and then you elevate to whatever it is. It's all about how you use your mental and, and, and about how you use your inner to reach to where it is you want to go to. In early reggae days, a lot of the, 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 the beats and, and the rhythm tracks that were there at that time never had vocals on them. So it was, it was a free space for a man to express himself one time. And they would actually get on the mic and be like, you know, jack it up one time, people. And just, just give it this kind of, I don't know, <coughs> it's this vibe, just give yeah. it that little flavor that it was, it just needed that little, just added emphasis. The crowd's getting off to the music and you just say one thing and the crowd just, mm, and they respond to that. And that, uh, that to me is how MC started. Our DJ original dance hall. The reason why, on the ragga circuit, an MC is called a DJ, is because back in the day, the D they were actually DJs. They used to chat on the mic and play the music at the same time. Our DJ original dance hall, you know what I mean? What they call bashy today is the same thing, nothing to change but the lyrics and the beat them start change up, you know what I mean? But I started out on dance hall. Yeah, that's where everything come from. Dance hall. And then because like, the rhythm track was so sweet and they just do this little thing like we say, oh, oh, seven, uh, or whatever. And then it would just fit so nicely that eventually they'd end up recording it, it would become a track and then it would be a massive hit. And that's how they really nurtured their careers and started off as MCs. Them sort of days when I was little, I was too young to know what was going on, but it was mainly a person, man, a female, bigging himself up picking up where they come from, their environment, you know. And then when it kind of got into the dance hall mode, which is just right at the end of the 70s going into the 80s, was when I decided, like, I love this thing so much and I know I can do it, I'm going to get on the mic. Well, I started emceeing back from the early 70s, coming back up to late 70s, coming back up to the 80s, you know, and Wild Bunch Disco in Jamaica which was uh, my uncle's disco, then I moved on to Youth Man Promotion, then I came to, to the tour, did the England, met Simon Harris, then Rodigan, and then the old thing kick off, Ragamuffin Hip Hop was born, um, Raga House, Raga Rock with Led Zeppelin, Daddy for the whole nine yards, you see me? Yeah. <laughs> Drum and bass give you something else. The sound system, you weren't with it. You know me, I have nothing to do with the sound system. The DJ come by himself. So we're using a sound system, you come with about 20 blokes, box boys, selector, owner, and other DJs, you know what I mean? But now with drum and bass, you go to the place, somebody got the, the promoter got the place. The, the promoter organizes a sound system and he organizes all the DJs. So all you do is bring yourself there, could the promoter call you by yourself? So that's not much baggage, you know what I mean? All you gotta do is get your script right. Cause I came from like, the early reggae sort of, cause my old man, he did sound systems and was part of the Aswad thing. And so I got the, the toast inside of it. You know what I mean? I used to carry, you know, go around with the sound system in the van and I'd see everything being played out. So I knew what it took to be on the sound system and be the artist. My earliest influences in music was through my uncle called Preacher. I used to run like a, a little sound thing down in Battersea called Providence in the 70s and 80s. After doing a dub plate, I see that a lot of people's taking notice of me and it, it continued. Then one day I got a call from 
Black Star sound and after working with Black Star, doing a quite a few things with, with Slipper Goldie, you know, it's classic on, on, on the radio, he's up on the heat wave, it still plays now. Um, then I went into V Rocket, who's run by Valerie Robinson, she runs that sound system, who also runs a radio station now. And doing that, I came across quite a few of the Nottingham DJs, and that is where I kind of started doing that little circuit there. When I was young in school, uh, we used to have our own Sam, we used to play at the school parties, them and the little house jams and thing. And I was the mic man, chatting to lyrics and styles and certain little dubs for the, for the crew and thing, you get me? With me, we started about 85. I started to um, work with sounds like Black Star. Well, first of all, Supertone sound. When I was like really young, 12, 13, 14, trying to think, didn't, my voice hadn't broken at the time. So it was a bit hard at, at the time. 1979. You know, and that's when I left school, 16 years of age, and just went out into the sound system world because I just wanted to do that. I always worked, I always had a job, I always, I always had a job, man. I always tried to earn some money, you know what I'm saying? Because you have to be real about it. You can't think you're going to be Nas or Puff Daddy or Busta Rhymes or whoever you think you're going to be. It's not going to happen like that. The Martians, the Martians are, are coming, coming this, this way. way. When I actually got into the scene, I'd never really heard a drum and bass MC. I hadn't heard any MCs, you know what I mean, really, on, on that scene. I didn't know who was who or what was what. I just knew what the music was. So I just did what I thought should be done, basically. Then the MCing thing was mainly through my cousin Rodney B, like when I was really young. And then he blew up, and then I didn't see him for a little while. And then by the time I saw him again, I started MCing. I, I used to be into like hip hop before. I went really, I didn't even like drum and bass before, you know what I mean? So, all the people there, you know what I mean? But I remember when hip hop was born, yeah? I remember when hip hop just came around and it was like the new thing on the telly, yeah? Where it's like, yo, look at these guys in America, they're richer, 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 and they're scratching and they're doing this, this thing called body popping and they're, they're breaking. And yeah, I remember when it was the new fad, yeah? And they thought, yeah, it's gonna be a little thing and it's gonna die. And look at hip hop now, yeah? And it's the same thing with drum and bass. 88, 89 like the acid house thing i wasn't really really into it you know what i mean because i came from the ragga side of it we, we thought it was devil music and shit like that but there were certain tunes that held me you know you know people may or may know that i kind of stumbled into the to the world of jungle drum and bass uh 93 92 93 you know everyone was just being infected by jungle everybody was starting to listen to jungle you know, I can't really get you know too deep into the hip hop now. I can't really get too deep into the ragga now because that's that's the uh, a ragga thing. That's an American thing, but this is a UK thing here. It's close to home. I feel I can you know do with some of this. The actual first rave I done was a rave called um, Outrage at Busby's, which was '91. Um, then I got into that with Telepathy '92, '93 which was doing like the wax club every week and just little things like that. But you know, I started off in Monday Club. Like with Rat Pack and all them people there and Holy Put of Man's them. Don't know who they are. You know what I mean? Started off a long time ago, 91, 98. Well, the first rave I went to, what I noticed all the, you know, MCs and when the limelight was, was roast, I think most of the, the, the raves at the time I came into, the MCs were a prominent thing, you know, the A-Team, the Five O's, Navigate a Debt. Uh, you know, even fearless. You know, these are guys that I remember when I was a nobody. Up until like 93, 94, I weren't really getting a lot of work. Maybe one or two things every week, or maybe one thing even every three weeks. Do you know? And obviously now things are just crazy, man. They're hectic. The first ones I actually got to know was like um, VIP crew, Hardcore General, Paddy and them boy there. Uh, Man Paris, Bassman, Stevie Ipar. God was his soul, Stevie died. And it's a bit of a madness for me because like, the way I see it, I was doing a lot of work with Mickey and stuff. And then when he died, I started to get more work, I started to question myself a little bit. Do you know what I mean? It's a bit fucked up to see when he originally died and go, and then all of a sudden you're getting more work, you know what I mean? I started to question myself a little bit and then say, well, all right, if that's, that's happened, and that will step up to the plate and represent for my mind, that's how, that's how he would be. Hearing Hyper D back in the day, stinging it, going in the rave scene, standing there as a raver, looking at the stage, oh, seeing yeah. what's going on, saying, yeah, I want to be there. You know what I'm saying? You know, and yeah. now I'm there. You get me? Sometimes I used to do the raves, you know what I mean? Like with, with my friend, my, 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 my late great friend, 
you know, um, um, Hyper D, Stevie Hyper D, you know, because you know me from back in the days, you used to come check me in Brixton and, you know what I mean? We go out the little um, one and two jungle them, you know what I mean? Because they sample my voice in the one in, one in, one in, one in, you know? So I was one of the first voices that they sampled along with Shabba Rankin, you know, make it steer so someone wanted Kosa Ragamuffin. That's me. Obviously, Cool FM, you know, has been there for almost 13 years now. They've been in it before it was even jungle, you know, they've been in it from just playing music. Reggae sound systems were like, a, it was like you're serving your apprenticeship as an yeah, MC, definitely. you know what I'm saying? A lot of the MCs nowadays are serving their apprenticeships on pirate stations, yeah. which is basically the equivalent of what a sound system was back in the day, really, a pirate station now. I went on to Cool FM in 92, and that's where I met a lot of people, met a lot of people like that's when I first met Navigator, because his show was on with him and Swift, the one-to-one -one show. One-to-one! -one. We used to come on after them, me, me and Crazy Legs, and like, just be holding up laughs in the studio, just four mad characters, and that's basically it, it moved on from there. Got on radio in about 95, 96, first radio station, Pressure FM, moved on to Rude FM. Certain things, certain conspiracies happened with Rude, broke off, <coughs> went on to Rude Awakening, Still there now, every Sunday, 8 till 10, X-Man, Herbsy. I had to go back to right back and, and serve my apprenticeship on, on Cool FM, you know what I mean? And I didn't, I was 30 then, and I didn't feel no way, I, I wasn't proud. But what I want to say to MCs though is that, no disrespecting, and even though you didn't work on a sound system to get where you are, it's harder still because there's nobody really guiding you when you're on a radio station. But when you're on a sound system, if you're no good, you know, they've got a replacement waiting in the wings for you, you know what I mean? I think the best one that we've been on is probably, it's got to be pyrotechnic for me. I quite love that one because they reach out to enough people, you get me? Loads of shout outs, it's love interactivity, and you know got, that? they got a proper yeah. set down. Yeah, proper like, set down there, like you get me? I hear that, man. Yeah. They're nice people to get along with as well, so yeah, pyrotechnic, boo! I mean, you always need a kind of a vocalist on the radio just to inform people about what's going on, what they're listening to. I went on Cool FM in March, no, in May. 93 and by like august i had channel 4 coming to me saying we want to do a documentary you know you guys are the biggest things in jungle as mcs and you know and there was people there wait the long long before me and i got approached first which straight away said to me you know it's just like when i was on the sound systems i used to go there and there'd be there'd be like 15 guys dissing me but there'd be three guys and two girls going, you know what, you're all right, you know, so that's what I feel off of that positive energy. They come to a point where one day they had a big meeting in Cool FM and decided that they was going to categorise us. And I weren't really feeling that and I ended up leaving about a year after that. Big respect to the MCs that come through off radio stations at the end of the day. But you see with Sound System, it's from the slavery days. It goes way back. So when you hear man talk lyrics, it comes with the actual you know what I mean, passion and a feeling where the people you can see in the audience face when you're emceeing that they say, well look, there's emcees and there's emcees, you understand me? Most emcees that are worth their salt or anywhere in the game have been on a pirate station, whether it be Cool FM, whether it be um, Rush, Weekend Rush back in the days, whether it be stations like that, that's where they mainly came from. <laughs> Persistence. <laughs> a lot of persistence. It's a long game. I've been in it a long time. I'm telling you, 12 years I've been in the game. So I want to big up everyone that supported me. And there's people out there that think I've just come. They think I've just like come in the last three, four years. So that's great. That means a lot of new people are getting into the music. So they need educating as well. And you got to have patience. But as you go along, you can see you can get more out of it for yourself. Yeah, well, you know, when you're starting out, you have to pay your dues. You know what I mean? You know, you have to go through the, the, what you call it, the struggle. You understand me? Seeing, okay, you book up on a lot of prima donnas, icons. You know what I'm saying? You know? So, you know, you just have to just know, say, you know, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to do it by any means necessary. Well, actually, I followed uh, my old producer, Simon Harris. He was in the Guinness Book already for doing the yo-yo. Yeah, yeah. I just went along, seen some people, about 15 or 20 people lined up in a line to go. And I'm standing up there watching them going up there. But I'm saying, what are they doing, you know? And Simon said, you, 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 they, they're trying not to break the, the speed rap. So I said, I could, I, could, 
I could fucking, <laughs> you know. Back on the back on the top of the top, do enough for them. Then take all my peanut man and peanut man, they get this is where they get it from. I could go up there and do better than that, blood. You know what I mean? So I went there and, you know, one time, it just broke the same time. Back on the back on the top of the top of the base, top of the top of the top of the base. You know what I mean? And then I met Roy Castle. Hello. He invited me back to um to break it live on BBC in um Shepherd's Bush. I went there and broke it again. Then they sent me to America. And I broke it back two more times. So, you know, four times in a row. So, original, no gold teeth, bad boy. They can break it now if they want to. I've, I've had enough. You know, I'm in Puerto Rico and I don't even know how they say it in their language, but they call me the Wattweiler in their language out there. And they're calling me like that from, you know, the first time I got there, you know, people are, yeah, hey, 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 the Wattweiler, the Wattweiler, and I'm just like, this is crazy. Some of them cats can't even speak English, you know what I mean? But they can MC their ass off in English, you know what I mean? It amazes me. You know, Australia, it's, just, it's crazy, it's crazy. Stand innovation business. You know, I have to go backstage. I need, I need escort and stuff because you get mobbed. You do get mobbed. It, there was a time when we weren't feeling the UK because the UK weren't feeling us. So that's why we went abroad, you know what I mean? And that's why, I mean, Germany's always embraced me from a longer time. And when, I, when you go to Germany, you see the love of the people. Do you know what I'm saying? I honestly think, um, to the work I've done internationally, I think is the main reason why I've been number one in the last three years. Strangest place, mm. Philadelphia. Cause you mind me a Bosnia blood. <laughs> the Amazon, the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. You to be in the middle of the Amazon. I said, the first rule of Congo is like, yeah, wicked. I wrote that in Peckham. Right about now, I've been quite a few countries. You get me, and everyone's feeling drum and bass. Like when you walk down in America, walk into a clothes store, they're playing drum and bass. You don't get that over here. Do you know what I mean? I've heard, Things I've like heard, that. I've heard people going on about drum and bass is a new house, blood. Yeah, that's one. That's, 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 that's our biggest game. Revolution, Foxy, revolution. Let's just let them call me fat, man. <laughs> I mean, other than that, it's all good. Best moments of my career so far, mm, I, sh I mean, it's got to be winning the awards. You know, there's so many of us emceeing week in, week out. And just to get some kind of, you know, some kind of reward for the work that you've done is, is, is been great. When you get booked for the States with the, with the raves, they'll have a room with drum and bass and another room will be hip hop. You know what I mean? So I'm mixing and rubbing shoulders and staying in the hotel as the iced teas and the M&Ms and, you know what I mean? You get to meet these people through your travels and they're like, yeah, and they actually big you up because they've actually heard what you've done and you're like, whoa. Done things like stuff in the charts as well, you know, being played on Radio 1 and stuff like that. That's Quite, quite a great achievement for me, you know what I mean? To be, to be played on radio. I think one of the best was when I done a done a thing there in Miami, that done the Ultra Festival a couple of years ago, and I think I think there's a big mix up with between Bad Company and a group called Bad Company in the States that do like rock and metal and shit. And I think they thought they was meant to be playing in the main main arena, and it ended up being like me, Vegas, Fat Man, and someone one of the other guys there from Bad Company performing in front of like like 15,000 people or something like that. Massive. The high points is just staying in the best hotels and just traveling the world every week and just meeting different people all over and seeing the crowd go wild and signing autographs. That's the, that's the high points, you know what I mean? The lifestyle is just crazy, but... I think, that's, I, think, I think that's the best part of the job, the, the buzz, you know, like when people say, like when you, when you get up on the, in front of a big crowd and you get some kind of response and that kind of thing, you get that well in the stomach, almost like tears to the eyes. Better than drugs, better than sex. If you catch me in a room full of people and they're like, oh, I can't do a rap, do a rhyme, it's like I get shy, I go in my show, it's like, oh. Fuck. But you give me a mic and put me on the stage, it's like the waiting thing goes and failures kicks in, you know what I mean? I feel like I've been on tour for five years. You know, you, you check Jay Z or Eminem and, or some certain big stars and they're like, yeah, we've been on tour for eight months and it's really hard and shit. This is really like being on tour for. for for like for the last five years. Running around late nights, lots of mileage on cars, points on your license. Hard work, man. I've been working so much throughout the week. Then come on a, on a Saturday night, where the, the largest event of the week is, I'm, I'm gone. I'm totally wasted. I haven't had a holiday since 1986. That's even before I started MC. I'm gonna have my first holiday next week for four days. I'm gonna go to Amsterdam and smoke weed. Boy, you can hear by my voice, man. I just come back from Cyprus, got off the plane, come straight here. I've cancelled like four shows yesterday and Thursday and Friday. 
and it's crazy. I'm doing like two and three a day, every day of the week. I maybe get one day off now. These days, it's not just Friday and Saturday gigs. Far from it. It's very much you get so you think Wednesday, Tuesday. There's, there's things all the all the time. A good week, I can do like ten, nine in three days sometimes. Like three and three, three on a Friday, three on a Saturday, three. So three on a Thursday, three on a Friday, three on a Saturday. On a bad week, one. But it's all like, it all upsets each other. Do you know what I mean? One check, 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 one. No, it's not a power struggle. DJs are scared. Yeah, it's not a power struggle. It's a case of, at the end of the day, you get some people like, yeah, you can go in a club and you, we'll put it this way, you can't have a night and put five MCs on the lineup and have no DJs, because that'll be a bit, bit nuts. Because back in the days, when you go through do magic or something like that now, the MC was back in the box. They just saw the DJ, you know what I mean? But now they've given us a stage because we look, we have pretty clothes and da, 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 and whatever and the kids want to, the kids want to like a little role model or something to look up to. So apart from a DJ just standing there just mixing away and not smiling. You see, I get on with nearly all the DJs because I've made a point to because I don't really want to be going on there and got to chat on the mic and the DJ wants to turn down the mic and all them kind of things there. So, is there a power struggle? I think there is a power struggle between some MCs and some DJs. Maybe from where they come from and the circles that they move in, because it's hard to detach yourself from that if that's where you're from. You know what I mean? I came from that side of things, and it's like somebody I said the other day, when I first got into it, because of the Tottenham, Edmonton, Hackney, West London, whatever beefs, like 88, 89, even from before that, and I think, right, I want to make something of myself and do this business and become an MC and whatever, and you're going in these raves, it's kids from all... North, South, East, West, bad boys, good boys, whatever. And you're coming in the rave to do your job and you're meeting a crew that you've got a rival with for the last four years, you know what I mean? And it's gonna kick off, right. you know? Sometimes it's not even your fault. Put this way, I ain't been in a, in a rave a long time where I can see a certain MC and I know he's a bad man or he's a da 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 Because you know what I mean? At the end of the day, I talk to everybody. You know what I mean? From skipper to bass man, to all that man there, to Shabba, to to fearless, to, you know what I mean? I speak to all them men there, they're, they're all the men that are cool. They ain't got no hostility, they don't go around with their face all screw up, you know what I mean? But for the MCs that are in that bad boy style and they bring that to, the, to their work and it makes it there and it kicks off, it ain't gonna do them no good because promoters see the trouble. They don't blame your mates, they came with you, so it's you, you know what I mean? And I can't afford that, I got kids to feed. I think MCs running their own raves are good as long as they're not concentrating on themselves and just the MCs and putting up a shit DJ lineup, which some MC parties have done and are very much guilty of doing. Because no, without, without no DJs, there, there wouldn't be no MCs. Yeah, you can have a rave with just DJs. Oh, like, kill a cow, you you know? can just have music, you get me, but you yeah. can't just have an MC in a club just spitting lyrics. That ain't going to work. Unless you've got Killer Cow and Razzle going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get some Roots band going and then we can start talking, you know mm. what I mean? When we do an MC convention, it ain't just a normal rave. People think it's just a normal rave, but it's a special occasion because it's our rave. We make it special. You know, MC convention only really started this year, the first of this year. Yeah, it did. It started the first of this year, and for a new rave, to, you know, to be so successful like that is, you know, it's kind of unheard of. It's just like the first one was like over two thousand people or so. Second one, all, they've all been over two thousand people, and it's just, I don't know. You can't really thought of that. Well, in their own raves, yeah, man. I think, I think that's quite dope as well. MC orientated raves. Do you understand me? But to balance it off, they should have DJ orientated raves as well. Do you know what I mean? But there needs to be a promoter to do that. Do you get me? But right by night, it's the, it's the MC's time. Do you know? What I mean? It's about bloody time. No, anyway. <laughs> Us MCs, we've been doing this thing for a few years now, of um, week in, week out, going into raves and then going home. Week in, week out, going into raves, and it's cool. But it's not very business minded, like, it's just like, okay, going to do a job and it could end at any time and there's not much to fall back on and stuff like that, you know. And when you've got that much faith in your style or whatever you're doing and then you've got a promoter saying, all right, you know what I mean, you're, you're not like Skibidi or whatever, so you're ranked like third on the steps, so you get this much and 
You know what I mean? It's hard. So some MCs are like, nah, forget this. I'm going to put on my own party and make my own stage. Sometimes, you know, you feel the pressures when you're doing as much as I am, four or five hours of just screaming at the top of your voice every weekend. Sometimes you think, yo, this is going to end at some point. And if I'm not putting a lot away now, then there ain't exactly a pension, a drum and bass pension thing going on. Like when Steve Hyper D passed away, I felt really funny that, you know, when he left, he only had um, the mixtapes as a kind of record of what you've done or, you know what I mean? I just think he deserves so much more than that, you know? I think, you know, but, you know, he was the number one MC at the time. I think he was just as good as the number one rapper at the time or the number one singer or the number one reggae artist. And I think he should have had just as much as them. He'd just be just as wealthy as them. <laughs> Why not? I know drum and bass isn't as big, but yo, that's what we're, that's what we're all working towards. One of the best things about the scene right about now is the amount of the amount of youth coming into it and the amount of youth that's that's feeling the music and, and the MCs as well. Uh just in Rochester the other night and also Tunbridge Wells a couple of weeks ago. Absolutely crazy. Kids going wild, even kids as young as six, seven, all the way up to eighteen going wild. The one just the other day was like fifteen hundred kids going wild. I brought my kids to a couple and I think that's good as well. You know what I mean? As I said, the message from you catch them early. And from before, they like some have older brothers and sisters, and that's that's all they see is the bad boy side of things. When you get under 18s and stuff, and people that's gonna make a difference, you can talk sense to them kids. And say, nah, that's not the way. This is the way. You know what I mean? And when the raves finished, they say, wow, that was a wicked rave. There were no trouble, and you know I mean, Mama was spitting pure good shit. And and that shows that you know there's definitely a future in the music more than anything, and then we're not just all stuck in our old grade ways or whatever, you know, we're definitely appealing to the kids. So yeah, no, enough of them under 18s. I've seen trouble in them, them little, them little kids, they came get rowdy, but that's just them being young. Rubbish. All that more fire one? Nah, mate. Nah, <laughs> nah mate. <laughs> MC's appearing on record, I think it's good when it's done well, i.e. more fire. Then me and Spider made a track called More Fire with, with you know, like Shabba, Tenor Fly, Soul Train. You know, it, it, was, it was a legendary record that we made. And then obviously Fresh Bad Company came and he remixed it and then Andy C came and remixed it. And it was just like, eventually, the whole thing just catapulted and then it exploded and snowballed into the next thing. Do you understand me? More Fire now is a legendary tune. MCs on records, well I think that's the next step really and truly, vinyl is power, do you know what I mean, end of the day. It's funny, you know, because basically a lot of producers that are DJs get a lot of work around the world because they're producers, you understand me, a lot of people have heard their records, do you know what I mean, so basically once they can possibly people hear your voices all around the world, they're going to want to hear you, that just means more bookings, more money, yeah, I'm all for it, man. <laughs> I've got a few tunes sitting there and I've tested a lot of them out, like I've been out in Iron Apple for six weeks, been toured the whole of Cyprus. Do you know what I mean? And played it over there and just to see people's reactions with the drum and bass. At the end of the day, sometimes, no disrespect to DJs again, the over modulating is like turn up the mids and trebs and you know what I mean and the bass and can't really hear MC too much. On a tune, you can hear what the MC's spitting about. Do you know what, right? Me and Rodney P, right, have been supposed to be doing a track for the last two years. And if you can find a date in my diary and a date in his diary, then we can actually sit down like this for five minutes and talk, it'll be heavy, then we can all actually get something done. This, this is the British hip hop. This is the British hip hop. And I think we missed our turn, but this time around, we're more educated. We can deal with it now. So when it comes, we'll be here. The game changes from, you know, every year and a half, two years, things changes. This year, last year is definitely the year of the MC. It's cool for us being an MC. Yeah, we're enjoying it right now, but you can't expect that to last forever. Yeah. I'm highly blessed. So much things I've been through in my life, so much ups and so much downs. I've tried to tell you about ups and downs and here's and there's. But you know what, right about now, the things I've seen in my life, I know I'm blessed. I must be blessed. Yeah, the MC, MC thing would go on, but I don't, know if, I don't know how long it will go on for. London right now is firing. England is firing for drum and bass. Don't make no one fool you or nothing. Drum and bass over here is the strongest music in the underground right now. I'm telling you that now.
When I wanna commercial weed, figure respond me chest. Think what me a bun is rated as the best. Come me, got me sticky, sticky, tight and compressed. Look upon the weed and ball out highly blessed. Can get it in the east and the northwest. Listen to the shabba, cause you know me just flex. Sun, sea, sand, sex. Highly blessed. Let's go and be a Serena. Raw punishment. I know you want to call it anyway. Ma go on like them, but them ma go on like them now me. Me the MC Fox, we say beg you come show me. Drum and bass arena, you're rough and ready, why? They don't know what we know. And... Who, who, who? Rolling massive. S come again, K come again, I come again, B come again, D come again, E come again, E come again, we come again, we come again, what are you trend? S come again, K come again, I come again, B come again, A come again, D come again, E come again, we come again, we come again, what are you trend? I'm gonna make ya, gonna break ya, gonna make some goddamn paper, ho! I'm the what the wild log, go go do go do, who star, who star, skipper, I'm a trooper, back to the back, back of the future, I'm gonna what, I'm gonna break ya, drum and bass arena! And I say yo, shut the sess to a push, President Bush. Shit! <laughs> Mr. Fearless, Uslin Beast, going out to all drum and bass arena massive. Come on! And never gonna rock with the general, I've been the most animal to the rave and tell them all. Original pen of mic, I'm a non criminal, not minimal. Unstoppable, incredible, lethal for the people. Red crew in the venue, I see you. No MC dropping like we do. Whoop, 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 boom. And that's a wrap. See ya! Live setup is um, the Jungle Drummer on drums, Andy Waterworth on bass, Landslide and myself um, playing live samples, Leanne Carroll on Wurlitzer and lead vocals, Stamina MC on vocals, and sometimes Robert Owens on vocals as well. We took something that people didn't think could be done live and we took it out live. We, we took it on the road and we exposed it to a wider audience. They, they look at it and they see what they recognise, a drummer and a bass player and two people standing there. And then uh, halfway through the night they'd realise it, it was jungle drum and bass being played live. The Represent lineup consists of four people on samplers, me, Crust, Ronnie and Sav, Cy John on stand-up bass and electric bass, Bobby Merrill on drums, Onnelly and Dynamite on vocals. Sound checks mate, I just can't, can't be done with sound checks man. Fucking... There were, there were certain personality disorders within the band. One of which was mine, and five of which were the Jungle Drummers. Tony, will you stop fucking about? Are we gonna fuck you, sir? The Jungle Drummer, who... I mean, he's like... I don't know, he's like... Billy Cobham, who is basically the best jazz drummer ever. He's like Billy Cobham, but if he had grown up to be a junglist, he'd be like the Jungle Drummer. Andy brings the real kind of like the jazz musicianship to the band, you know, with his with his upright bass, and he kind of he makes his bass sound like an 808. Basically, he gets an amazing sub out of his bass. Landslides brings the kind of like. He brings the real sort of nerdy kind of, and I mean that in the nicest possible sense, by the way, because I love landslides. But he brings the real sort of like scientist vibe into the band. If you see him play, he plays his percussion pads and he looks like a Thunderbird puppet. Robert is kind of the, he's like the counsellor in the band. Um, he brings his, his wisdom and his kind of love. And if any of us are spinning out, we just have to get into a room with Robert and have a little one-to-one -one and he kind of brings you down to earth and kind of sorts out your head. Leanne Carroll, she's like this kind of complete crazy spirit, a total free spirit, I've never met anyone like her. She's the best keyboard player I know, let alone the best female vocalist from this country. Um, and she just, every gig is completely different with Leanne, but there's always something magical that she pulls out of the air. 
stamina, who is in my book the best MC around at the moment, and um, a wicked singer. And like stamina just comes in and he just slots in with all the harmonies as well. <laughs> I think I bring uh, to Uncut <laughs> the mistakes and <laughs> the general, f like, yeah, the fuck ups basically. I bring spontaneity, vocals, charisma, and beauty. I'm a, com a comedian first yeah. and foremost, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and you bring then, the jokes, though. Yeah, yeah, I bring, I bring the jokes yeah. and also the ideas and the inspiration. <laughs> and, uh, I, also the technical ability of how to do it. Yeah. At the moment we've got like um like a hard disc playing like the body of the tracks, so the beats and stuff like that. Um, I play a bit of keys too. He's got like a, the studio kind of set up at the you know which kind of I suppose runs the main set. Obviously Jenna's on vocals and then we've got a bass player, a guy called Clive Hunt Pops. or Pops, <laughs> who because uh, we just kind of we felt like especially the kind of music we're making that bass was the one thing we really wanted to kind of to keep always like live, you know what I mean? We had four samplers on stage, full to the brim with all the elements of the tracks. So yeah, I'd love like a riff sound, Cross to be on the strings, Ron will be playing bass and Sav will be doing like special effects. We've got a laptop running Ableton Live, which is this really hot new software. It's, it's awesome. And so we'll, we'll bounce down the parts into stems and a stem is like, you know, we'll have drums, music, backing vocals, strings and a click track for the drummer. Um, and then all of those will be get routed to a mixing desk, along with splits of the live thing. So we'll have, we've got a guitar player, a bass player and double bass player, um, a drummer and vocalist. The clubs that don't have facilities for live drums, um, I use like electronic, a D-drum for electronic kit and for the clubs that have facilities for live drums I use um, two or three snare drums, um, cymbals and obviously like toms and um, one, one bass drum. Uh, back then we were using 760 samplers made by Roland and um, monitors plus we were doing like a lot of uh, layering with the drums and stuff. The drums were all had like backed up with the, the sampled drums from the album and breaks from the album plus Cy John was using um, a stand-up bass, one the electric one though, so it wouldn't feed back too much. Uh, live is is where no one in the band is wearing headphones. Um, it's it's where what the audience hear, all they hear is what's being played by people on the stage. There is no playback. That's live. Our definition of live will vary from other people's definition of live. I think today we're fortunate to have technology at our disposal so that we can take things um, semi-live, you know, DJ live or full band live. When you think of live, you do sort of think, oh, I might really think of a band and stuff, but it doesn't, matter, it doesn't have to yeah. be like that. You know what I mean? When you've, if you've got like a little studio set up, what you can be doing live is going to just be as interesting as playing a bass or playing a guitar, do you know what I mean? Just flicking in, in effects in and out, do you know what I mean? And using dub delays and stuff. So we we'll say it's our third ever gig. Still a little bit nervous. Ain't that the truth? Well, I am anyway. You're not nervous, Jungle, are you? Is using a sampler forbidden? No, not at all. Because drum and bass is all about samples. And um, me and the landslide, we divvied up all the samples in the tunes and we found out which, one actually, which ones work live. Um, we had to do a lot of chopping up because if you've got like a, like a filtered loop or something that is, that is the basis of a tune, you can't just have the loop going because then everyone's got to synchronise to that loop, so it's not live. So what you have to do is chop the loop up into a hundred parts and then you spread it across the keyboard and you can play each part so that means that you can play to the drummer so you're turning it into an instrument by doing that. Um, when we made the first album we didn't really make tunes with the idea of playing them live but we had to kind of translate them to playing live and um, it worked on some of them you know some of them we had more problems with but definitely writing the second album we were a lot more writing with each person in mind like say someone would put a section in they play that section live. I always really enjoy bringing the, the, the stuff to live because um, it adds a, 
you know, studio is such a perfectionist sort of place. You know, I spend thousands of hours on every track. You know, sometimes getting just the right sound and making it just right. And, um, and you know, live it's got a certain amount of well. It, if we fuck it up, we're doing it again tomorrow, you know. You start from scratch, basically, um, and it's not even like you're remixing a tune for live. You just deconstruct it completely, break it down into all the individual components, throw most of them away, find some new ones, and then rehearse for absolutely bloody ages. So that's what live music is, isn't it? You know, if people want perfect music, they'll buy the CD and listen to it. Oh. Now. What's freestyling all about? It's about being able to speed up and slow down when you're playing live so that, you know, if the audience are in it, you just speed up slightly and it gets more and more exciting and then you just kind of switch it and you spin right down to breakbeat tempo. And we can just change the structure as we want. So it's just like chopping and changing, you know, I'll, I'll kind of wave my hands in the air and the band will stop and we'll have a little a cappella section. And it's just about fucking about with all the structures. If, if, if you've got different channels and different effects and, you know, you can speed things up and slow things down and loop sections, it's like you're, you're moulding a piece of material and every shape, at the end of every gig, each piece is going to look different. Why are you playing live? I don't really know. Because um, someone told me to. No, it's all, it's all, it's, I blame it all on Fabio and Groove, actually, because... About a year ago, they sat in for John Peel on Radio 1 and they, they took over his Thursday night live session for four weeks. And their producer phoned us up out of the blue and said, look, we want London Electricity to come and play live. And I was just like, I didn't even think about it. I was just like, uh, all right then. And then it was one of those where you commit to doing it and then you have no sleep for about a week because you realise what you've just said you're going to do. And it was properly live broadcast, no taping, nothing. And we managed to get three tunes together with about three days rehearsals and we just scraped through it but it, I could just see how good it was going to be if we did it properly. Playing to like thousands of people on decks is like it's really good buzz but you also know that you're not, you haven't, you're not, it's not yourself what's out there, it's the tunes what are doing the work, you get me? So it's like if it's going slightly wrong you can always put on like a little Dillinger track or like a lead rush lap's called track and you know it's going to save the day. We're doing it live, it's your own stuff, do you know what I mean? That's it. It's like there's no little get out clause, it's what you are, it's what you've been in the studio for six months doing. And if people don't like it, do you know what I mean? It's a lot, it's a lot closer to you. When we first started, I was like, oh God, what if it crashes and what if it goes wrong? And I think it's very easy just to just be completely drained if that happens. Um, you know, go, oh no, this has gone down. And, and then you, you've lost the rest of the gig because you, your head's now in that bit of kit that's gone down. The drums go and you've got sound problems and. You, in the London Electricity thing, we're not using any clicks, any metronomes, anything. We're just doing the whole thing live. I get everyone going, you've messed up. And it's worse than this band, the London Electricity band, because we've all got like, um, everyone individually is, is like amazing at what they do. Some of our best moments at stage, you know, is when something goes down and all the lights go off and the computer dies and, you know, everyone's in the dark for a few seconds, then it all comes back on and it's like, ah! You know, because people are, you know, see that it's really happening live, which I think ultimately they admire. To get a crew together, for instance, on the last tour we were like 20 something people deep, two trucks, two coaches, that's a lot of people to take around the world, you know what I mean? And now we've got like eight people and we're struggling to take that around the world. So it's like, it just depends on what people uh, want to do fully live. I mean, we was writing with orchestras. And um, we couldn't afford to take an orchestra out live with us, you know what I mean, stuff like that. So, so we just had to work out a way how we could do it live, but also, do you know what I mean, also have everything in it. So there's certain things that are coming off hard disk and, and the hard drive and stuff. For example, our first album, it's got like vibraphone, brass section, string section, um, all manner of percussions, you know. So to actually tour with all of those instruments would be, you know, would be a touring party of about 30 which is just completely unpractical and completely unaffordable. I think 
some of the sort of, I guess, lesser known, like some of the sort of lesser known bands we've seen sort of who do like drum and bass, or whatever. That's been the problem. It's like the drums just haven't been tough enough. They've been a bit kind of tin pot, and I guess sound a bit too kind of like a garage band. Do you know what I mean? Rather than a than a drum and bass act. Yeah, I think it's not difficult to play it, but um, the hardest thing when you're recording live drums is to get them to come out live and not overproduce because it, it ruins what you're trying to do. Um, like obviously the king is, is Dillinger at, at getting the drum sound down. It represented a really good live, do you know what I mean? And when, when they did Trastonbury, uh, Glastonbury, and um, it was like televised, do you know what I mean? They got like, a, lot of good, a lot of good press off that, do you know what I mean? People were in it because of the energy. It's really hard to, to actually get the snares and the kicks to come out really, really good. The kick's all right, but to get the snares and all the little notes you do to make like the, the beat sort of swing, that, that's difficult. Drum and bass is just all about energy. And fucking hell, man, if you can't do it live, then that's what energy's about, isn't it, really? <laughs> We did our first gig in Edinburgh last week um, and uh, we've been rehearsing so hard but we had no idea what it was going to be like, how people would receive it. It was a kind of junglist crowd and uh, we thought maybe they'd be standing and watching, like liking it but just kind of going, uh, what's going on? But then it was shirts off in the first number in Billion Dollar Gravy, everyone had their shirts off and they were just fucking... They were moshing, it was, it was like a Beastie Boys gig or something. People are used to seeing like a band invite, you know, going out to see a band. There's a whole other audience out there, older audience, that goes out to see concerts. And I think it attracted them. Yeah, I did appear on Top of the Pops <laughs> last year. That was a shy effects doing Shake Your Body. Um, before I did it, I was like, wicked, Top of the Pops, great. But um, yeah, I was sort of, I had to mind really, so wasn't really the same as, as doing it live. People have got funny ideas about drum and bass and we all love it because we're, we're all involved in it and in some ways it's good that it's never really broken through because that, that's what keeps people loving it. I think the strength of drum and bass is that it is underground. I went to like America in December and played with DJ Craze and it, it really sort of blew my mind. Um, people coming to the clubs that had never seen anyone play the DJ before. Like, it, it was amazing for me to watch people's reactions. And Over the past like six, seven years, there's been loads of live sort of drum and bass bands come and go, do you know what I mean? But each one who's come has like, took a little something from what, bit, what came before them. You know I mean, just added to it. So I think, I, think it's, I think it's just a slow progression, but it'll get there, definitely. To get to an arena stroke stadium, kind of level. I'm not sure about that. I mean, you know, some people have tried it. It doesn't work, man. Forget about it. It's, it's all about letting it build organically. And if it builds to the point where suddenly you can play in a, in a big venue and it goes off, wicked. But that's not what it's all about. That's not why any of us are doing this. Anyone who tries to force it onto another level, they're just going to come a cropper. Started producing about 97. Um, my mate popped into a studio and come out with something like, in a couple of hours and I thought, yeah, if you can do that in a couple of hours, we'll give it a go. Spent a day in there, started going there on a weekly basis and just got into it, bought my own studio, started doing it from home. I 
I've been listening to like, well it was hardcore back since about 91, 92, like I used to go to school with me Walkman on, listening to like Donovan Bad Boy Smith, all them sort of things. And I like, just, over the years, just been buying tapes, records, it's just a love for music, you know what I mean, since like, from a young age. So how did you get to where you are today? Well I met Lee Roy at our music house, SS, and uh, he, he, he liked my tunes so he took them on. Like everything I sent him from there, he was taking. And like he's like pushing my name wherever he can. And I like then Groove Rider sort of picked up on my tunes, started playing, playing a lot of them, like most of my tunes. And like people listen to Groove Rider. There's quite a, there's quite a few people playing my tunes. I've heard Andy C's playing some. I've heard I've heard all sorts of people. Jay Magic. I've heard Bailey play some. There's loads of people playing, and like, it's all good. All right, this is my debut album, Tooled Up forthcoming on Formation Rebels. I hope you've been, you enjoy it. I've spent the last eight, nine months doing it. That's me on the front there. And the trusty gimp mask, best hundred pound I've ever spent. This is gimp mask. This is my favourite thing off the album. This is what inspired me to buy this thing up here and the artwork for it as well. I had good fun making this because, I don't know, it was just all messed up. I put a break in a Rex file and it went on the wrong key and, that's, and it played the break all out of sync so it was just an accident and it goes off in the club too so. This one's trench foot, this is another one of my favourites off there because I know it's just different to what I normally do, it's a bit more musical and I heard Bailey play this at the weekend and I ain't really heard it played out and it went off good so I'm happy with that one. It's another one few people are playing, it's going off alright in the clubs. Every time I play, I get some rewind, everyone goes mad to it, so... Got a nice little sample in there, Optimus Prime, and the Transformers. I was meaning to do it for years, but I've only just got hold of the video, so... It's going on this tune. I've done my own vocals on this one. Oh, me and a couple of my mates were in here one night, just stoned off our tits and screaming down the mic. And I've got this plug in, it's like an electric guitar thing, and it's pucker. Screaming all sorts of fucked up shit down the mic. It was a good laugh. How did you first get your tunes heard of? Now I met SS down Music House and he took Wales off my hands. And like everything I've done since then and I've sent up to him and he liked and just thought like I stayed there, you know, Formation was one of my favourite labels back in the day, so it was good to be where I was. I prefer to make the more off-key sort of stuff because I've been doing the jump up cheesy thing for years now and I can do them tunes all day long and the off-key stuff's a challenge for me so things like Gimp Mask and, and I, just like, I just like the off-key stuff and the musical stuff as well we're doing a fair few bits of that like, it's just good to have a change like, I've been doing 4-4 garage as well to help pay the bills I know people say selling out and all that but it's good to have a break you know from the norm uh, there's lots of producers I like to work with uh, loads of like Zinc, the Ram Boys, Full Cycle. Uh, you might catch that from me and Simon Baseline soon. We've been talking about it and Dylan as well. We've mentioned it. There's loads of people. I'm just a normal kind of bloke, you know, just up for a laugh, man. Oh, when are you back on Rude? Like uh, I try to go down to Rude Awakening like, when I can. I have a good laugh down there. Been on there a few years, but it's just difficult now, like living in Leicester. I'm going to try and do it once a month, you know, like keep in touch, but I do have a good time when I go down there. It's a laugh, so. um, any tips on for aspiring producers? Uh, yeah, just stick at it. I stuck at it and I got there finally. I mean, I'm making a wage out of it now. I used to dig holes for a living and make tunes at night, and for years it was going on skint. And you'll get there in the end if you stick at it. I might start work on my second album. See how, see how well the first one does first. I've got a few remixes to do. And right now, what I'm interested in. Let's go to see the greedy girls in there. See you later, boys. <laughs> Take my love, I'm in the house, but it's a good thing I'm under Take my love, I'll be out of the house
Easy. MCMC. Fresh. Easy. <laughs> Fresh. Um, we're filming the video for More Fire at the moment. Today is kind of like the culmination of weeks of like a lot of effort from a lot of people. A lot of the time you see drum and bass tunes getting into the charts and they're not really tunes that the underground supporting. So it's good that we've had an opportunity to be sort of involved with something that people are excited about outside of drum and bass. <laughs> I'm EDK from Germany, Raw Hill Crew. We we done the original version of the More Fire, and then the PC version is coming. And now today we're in London to doing the video shot. When Back Company has a part, we're doing the same thing again with us. Then we have we can split it and build both versions: one video for our version, and one for the Bad Company version. At the end, the stations choosing what version they want to play, and we we are Germans. We go in, into the German market and look what happened there because drum bass is really big in Germany, popular. What do you think of the filming of the video today? Is it been nice yeah. to come along and see everyone? Yeah, it's fun, man. Everyone's just like, all the people, most of the people from the scene are there, just uh, chilling, having a laugh. Nah, it's good, man. Kenny Ken. Shabadi. Is it is it good being here and seeing everybody from the industry and seeing people you know as well as sort of fans? Like, is that a good yeah, buzz? Yeah, because I chatted to a whole heap of people I ain't seen for ages, so it's really good. And got a few dub plates as well. <laughs> What do you think of today so far? How's yeah, it going? It went good, went really good. You know, I got big up all the man, then Bad Company, Navigator, Spider, all the Royal Crew. Wicked took part in the video today. Went absolutely, I think it went good today. Is there, is there like a story running through? There's a, an actor in, in, uh, in this um, video who plays a punk MC. Yeah? This guy uh, doesn't want Navi and Spider or the whole Royal Crew to, to bust. Yeah? He wants to hold them down a little bit. So. What he did was he uh, uh, hired two girls, said to these two girls, yeah, check Navi and Spider, put something in, th in their drink so that they can't do the show at movement. Yeah, so they fell asleep and they can't do the show. So they woke up in this house and they don't know where they are. They get a kind of flashbacks what happened last night. Yeah? In the next minute, uh, Navi gets a phone call from EDK and Fresh Easy. saying, yeah, what's going on? Because it seems like this punk MC wants to take over the party. So Navi and Spider realize what happens and say, yeah, okay, wait a minute, hold on, we're coming down to London, yeah, go into this club and take and, and uh, tell the punk MC what's going on. And the punk, MC's, uh, punk MC runs away because he's scared of them. Um, yeah, we're from a um, German production company called Vision L. And we've been approached by U3R and um, BC Recordings. It's a really European kind of endeavor, German uh, record label, German production company. We're shooting on DV cam for the technically interested and we'll be really heavy into post-production. Three weeks of uh, heavy post-production. Now the porn scene that we were doing early with me and some birds didn't really go very well because the, the director, he was feeling a bit squeamish. He didn't want to get up for the close shots. Apart from that, everything's been really cool. We had um, we had a scene with a Hummer dropping off Navigator and Spider at the club. Um, that went really well. Yesterday we were shooting in an old building, sort of 600-year-old building in the country. Ockwell's Manor, which is uh, a house that was built in like 1430, and um, it was stunning. So uh, that looks pretty bling. Um, and then obviously everything today, a lot of people turned up to show support and it's going really well. A lot of, a lot of our friends are here, you know, my old friends that I've grown up with and like my sisters were here today. Uh, so like it's, it's been a really elated feeling. It feels like a sort of stressful birthday party. And I think after this I need to go and have a drink and just kind of chill out for a bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's gone really well. Uh, the, um, the Raw Hill crew were, uh, you know, really good. You know, they were good, putting on a good performance and everything. And uh, uh, all of the uh, industry came down and supported it. It was really good. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the day. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Okay, what do you think of the tune for the video today? The tune's all right. The original I'm not too keen on, but the Bad Company remix is all right, yeah. Right, can we do some fucking dancing, please? Because this is drum and bass, not fucking garbage. It needs but, to be heard in a loud system. You know. You need to turn it up in there. Got some layers. It's going to be good. I heard the tune quite a while ago, but definitely feeling it the first time we heard it on the dance floor. Just smashed it up. It's the top zone. Uh, when it drops, well, everyone's got to go fucking mad. Uh, how do you think the video's gone today? Have you enjoyed it? Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, it's been fun. It's good for the drum and bass scene to be getting out commercially, so it's doing good. This plan 
that the video will be played in early January because the tune will be released in, let's say, mid-January. You know what we're saying. Keep it. Slayer. Whoa!